Well, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, dear colleagues, uh, let's uh, continue the conference with the next panel, which um, is about Europe in the Cold War. Uh, very interesting topic, and we have uh, five presenters. So it's a very popular topic. And uh, let me introduce the um, uh, presenters. The uh, first uh, presenter is uh, Natalia. Uh, oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, first presenter is uh, Natalia Dimich, uh, who is an old friend already because she was uh, a member of our conference already last year as well. Uh, she's from the University of Belgrade and she's a PhD candidate. Uh, she will talk about the German question and Yugoslavia uh, after the Second World War. And then we have Bogdan Zipkovic <clears throat> uh, from the La Sapientia University in Rome, in Italy, uh, who is a PhD candidate also. <clears throat> uh, he will talk about suppressed de-Stalinization, Yugoslavia, the Communist Party of Italy, and the Hungarian crisis of 1956. And then the next presenter is Ratsko Lompar, <clears throat> University of Belgrade, who is an MA student. And he will talk about Tito's uh, secret weapon, uh, right-wing political prisoners as anti-Soviet propagandists between 1948 and 1950, so right after the split. Uh, and Mark Debrecen, uh, who is from the University of De Debrecen, um, uh, who is a PhD candidate there, and the title is In the Shadow of the Party, Hungary and the Olympic Games of 1984. And then uh, Tomasz Czanady is the last presenter in this panel, uh, is uh, from uh, Corvinus University, or our university, and actually he's a PhD student of mine as well. I was also um, uh, instructing him in um, uh, our classes, um, and um, he will talk about um, how did France's national role conception affect its role in the Cold War. So these are all very interesting topics, and without further ado, let's uh, start um, uh, the discussion and the, and the presentations. We have um, uh, 15 minutes um, uh, for everyone, and, uh, and uh, of course we can come back to the issues um, uh, uh, later as well during the discussion um, time. So uh, the first presenter is, uh, is Natalia. Natalia Timic, please take the floor. It should be working. So mm -hmm. Try to use it. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Phillips and Professor Beckett for co-organizing this conference for the second year in a row. Um, and as Professor Beckett has already stated, the topic of my presentation today uh, will be about the German question and Yugoslavia in the first two and a half decades after the, the end of the Second World War. Several years ago, I attended a monthly course in German language and culture in Berlin. And the light motive of the course was the question, what is German? What, and what does it mean to be German? There were some 20 people from different countries and continents, including myself, who tried to agree on the common answer. However, our answers varied from Goethe to Bertolt Brecht, from Bismarck to Berlin Wall, from Berlinale to Oktoberfest, from Weimar to Auschwitz, from Prussian militarism to Brandt's knee fall. The multiplicity of our answers reflected very well the multilayeredness of German identity. Their multitude spoke about the importance of Germany and the German question to each of us, regardless of where we came from. The German question is most commonly associated with the question of German unification in the 19th century, as well as during the Cold War. However, the German question has not ceased to exist either with the unification of 1871 or with the reunification of 1990. Brendan Simpson stated in an article in 2013 that, quote, the German question has dominated European politics for 600 years and will continue to do so, end quote. I won't go back to the Middle Ages in tracing the origins of the German question, but from the late 18th century onwards, the German question has undoubtedly been the central issue of European order, balance of power, and security. Furthermore, 18th century was the period when a sense of German nationalism began to emerge alongside regional identities, and when writers and intellectuals gave rise to the German cultural identity and the idea of a German Kulturnation. Although Germany's unification occurred as a consequence of wars rather than revolution, 
both the traditions of uh, bourgeois liberalism and that of Prussian militarism continue to dominate the German national and cultural, and cultural identity. In his book entitled The German Question, published shortly after the reunification, Dirk Verheyen has provided a comprehensive analysis of various aspects the German question encompasses. He has identified four, and four main and interrelated dimensions of the German question, namely the question of German identity, the question of German unity, the question of Germany's place and role in international relations, and the question of German power. Unsurprisingly, he has stated that to Germans themselves, the German question largely revolves about the question of identity, whereas non-Germans are mainly concerned with the question of German power. This divergent nature of German question causes difficulties not only in Germany's relation with other countries, but also for historians venturing into an analysis of these issues. With this in mind, there are at least two ways to approach the topic Yugoslavia and the German question in the Cold War. Both the GDR and the Federal Republic of Germany were mainly concerned with demonstrating that they were the genuine representatives of the German people. Their perspective in dealing with the outside world was to a large extent self-centered or German-centered. As German sources clearly show, the question of German identity was at the, was at the center of attention of both German states during their, their Cold War competition. On a diplomatic realm, until early 1970s, West Germany was pursuing the policy of isolating the GDR, whereas East Germany put, put all its efforts in achieving diplomatic recognition. However, their competition work was far more complex. The two states competed in the field of economy and culture as well. In different ways and manners, both states claimed to represent what they perceived as positive German traditions. Yugoslavia was, on the other hand, preoccupied with the problem of managing and controlling German power. It stands to where the German question largely reflected its overall position in the bicolor world. So far as the German-Yugoslav diplomatic relations are concerned, several distinct phases can be discerned. After siding with the USSR in the first post-war years uh, uh, until the 1948, Yugoslavia had diverted its foreign political orientation westwards and established relations only with West Germany. Another phase in Yugoslav-German relations began in 1957 when Yugoslavia recognized East Germany, which was followed by an immediate break of diplomatic ties with Bonn. Although economic and cultural cooperation between Yugoslavia and the Federal Republic continued to develop, only in 1968 were diplomatic ties re-established. At, at that moment, the German question itself had begun to change, which resulted in Bonn's recognition of the existence of the GDR in the years to follow. However, Yugoslavia's attitude towards the German question is far more complex than its diplomatic relations with two German states. A closer look into the changing stance of Yugoslav leadership's stance towards the German question speaks about the development of Yugoslavia's foreign policy. It reveals that the events of 1957, the recognition of the East Germany and break of relations with the West Germany, might have been a turning point only on the level of diplomatic ties. In fact, they were merely a consequence of a fundamental change in Yugoslavia's foreign policy. In other words, the moment when Yugoslav leaders started to observe the German question as a central issue of European security and the international order, was the moment when ideological state of mind was replaced with comprehensive foreign political thinking. Furthermore, alongside its relations with Moscow and Washington, it was the German question which influenced Yugoslavia's foreign policy and decision making. I will now proceed to a more tiresome part of my presentation, which is unfortunately necessary in order to show how Yugoslavia stands towards the German question correlated with its overall foreign policy development. When the Second World War ended in 1945, the Communist Party emerged as a winner not only against the occupying forces, but in the Civil War as well. Its rise to power significantly changed its role and responsibilities. Party officials became statesmen of the re-established Yugoslavia almost overnight. However, change in their awareness and ideologically framed worldview could not occur at such a, at such a rapid pace. It was a gradual process which required time. Used to following the directives from Moscow, Yugoslav communists continued to side with the course of the USSR in all important foreign political issues. In the question of Germany's fate, Yugoslav leaders supported 
all decisions made by four great powers, thereby expressing the belief that it was the best way to solve all important international problems. At the same time, they were facing extremely complex inner, inner political situation. At the end of the World War II, Yugoslavia is economically devastated, nationally, religiously, and socially divided. And Yugoslav communists perceived the German question through the lenses of the war victory, of the victory against the world fascism, and the strong revolutionary self-awareness. The German question was linked to the issue of reparations, war guilt, war crimes, victims, and the, and the extradition of German minorities from Yugoslavia. In this period, the German question had an inner political dimension for Yugoslavs and foreign policy was left to Moscow. The break with the common form in 1948 was indeed the turning point, probably the most important one in the post-war history of Yugoslavia. But however crucial this turning point was, it did not occur as a consequence of a deliberate choice. Yugoslav leaders did learn on their own example that a small country's fate should not always be decided upon by great powers, but their ideological state of mind and dogmatism could not fade away overnight. Party was still present in foreign political decision making. Diplomatic representatives were exchanged with West Germany only, and Yugoslavia's stance towards the German question was in the accordance uh, in accordance with the official line with the official line of the Federal Republic in the West. But at the same time, the Communist Party of Yugoslavia embarked on a secret mission of founding and funding a revolutionary party in West Germany with an ultimate goal of conducting a revolution in the Federal Republic. This unusual adventure was, however, doomed to fail, and the significance of the relations with West German government continued to, continued to rise since it became the most important trading partner and credit provider to Yugoslavia. However, it is worth noting that a constant fear of a strong, remilitarized and united Germany existed among Yugoslav politicians, which diplomatic correspondence between Belgrade and its embassy in the Federal Republic clearly shows. Another turning point, turning point occurred during 1953. In March, Joseph Stalin died. Yugoslavia's reporting on the Berlin up uprising of June 1953 was unusually balanced, which was a clear sign of a changing political stance. In November the same year, Tito gave an interview to American journalist Walter Lippmann. When asked about the opinion on the unification of Germany, Tito answered that it would not occur in the nearest future, but that it would and should come from the inside and be brought about by the German people themselves. This was the first interview given to Western media in which Tito expressed a stance different than that of West German government. Although the change in Yugoslavia's stance occurred simultaneously with its gradual rapprochement with, with the East, um, it is important to state is that a change in Yugoslavia's uh, stance towards the German question occurred uh, no later than 1953. And it is important for several reasons. First, uh, it happened before Khrushchev launched the two states theory, which indicates that the change did not occur only as a consequence of rapprochement with Moscow. Second, the perception of the German question was no longer only ideological or economic in nature. And third, Yugoslavia adopted the stance that each nation, regardless of its size and other great powers, should determine its own destiny, a principle Yugoslavia would rely on in its non-aligned policy. In June 1956, Josip Tito traveled to Moscow for the first time since 1945. At the Dinamo Stadium in Moscow, he gave a speech in which he stated that the existence of two German states was a political reality. This statement echoed wide across Europe. Western capitals were alarmed. It was interpreted as a clear sign of Yugoslavia's return to the Eastern Bloc. Despite having recognized East Germany in 1957, Yugoslavia did not return to the embrace of the Soviet bloc. On the contrary, it, it entered the so-called second ideological conflict, which would last until early 60s. The importance of the speech held in Moscow lay not only in the fact that Yugoslavia recognized the existence of two German states. This was not the first time such a political stance was expressed. This time, however, it resonated widely. Yugoslavia's foreign political attitude towards the German question had for the first time gained international importance and drew worldwide attention. 
What has started at the Dynamo Stadium in Moscow became even more obvious at the Belgrade Conference of Non-Line Countries in September 1961. In the meantime, Yugoslavia's relations with third world countries were becoming ever closer, which raised its standing and importance in the international relations. Both the German governments were keeping track of Yugoslavia's activities in the third world since the battlefield of the German Cold War was expanding to the continents outside Europe following the process of decolonization. The way the participants, the participants at the Belgrade summit would treat the German question gained even greater significance due to the Second Berlin Crisis, which exploded during the summer of 1961. The idea that each people should decide about its own destiny evolved into a principle that the voices of small nations about various international issues should be heard. And several speeches held during the conference Tito stated that the existence of two German states was a political reality which should be accepted in, or, in order to avoid a conflict. This stance was strongly opposed to political doctrine pursued by West Germany and highly unfavorable to the West since it was concordant with the foreign policy of the Eastern Bloc countries. Other participants at the Belgrade Conference expressed similar opinions about the German question and the Berlin crisis. George Cannon, at the time the US ambassador to Yugoslavia, did not expect that Tito's speech would be so one-sided. However, he wrote to the State Department that he doubted Yugoslavia would ever return to the Eastern Bloc, but that its standing in the German question was in line with Moscow due to the fear of a strong and united Germany. In his opinion, Yugoslavs would only support the, the unification of a demilitarized and weak Germany. An analysis of Yugoslavia's stance towards the German question since 1945 provides an overview of, it, of evolution of its foreign policy and political, principle, for political principles. From supporter of decisions made by great powers, Yugoslavia became a proponent of the principles that small states and nations not, should not only decide their own destiny, but that their voice about major international issues should also be heard. There is, however, another aspect of this story. Tito used every opportunity during his meetings with various world leaders to discuss the German question, thereby expressing and explaining Yugoslavia's opinion and trying to persuade them to adopt the same stance. Why was the German question so steadily and ceaselessly important to the Yugoslavs that they continued to raise this issue throughout the decades? I would suggest that after the first phase of ideological dogmatism, Yugoslav leaders um, became aware that the German question was a central issue of European order and um, of European of international order in general and European in particular. At the same time, at least Tito was convinced that Germany would ultimately reunite as a consequence of German people's will. On the other hand, when Yugoslavia in the mid 50s finally stabilized its posi position between the blocs and started dynamic cooperation with non-European countries, it was nevertheless aware that every change of the status quo in Germany would have tremendous consequences on the international order and would potentially endanger the, the position and role Yugoslavia was acquiring in the international arena. During the consultations with the military leadership in 1966, Tito, being well aware of the deep and complex crisis Yugoslavia was facing on various levels, stated three factors that could trigger its demise. First being the conflict between its peoples and nationalities. Second, conflict with one of the superpowers. And third, the fall of the Berlin Wall. From this perspective, this, this statement seems prophetic. When the crisis in Yugoslavia exploded at the beginning of the 90s, all three factors con contributed to its outcome. This statement also enables us to confirm our assumptions about the importance of German question to Yugoslavia. This awareness that the change of European order could lead to political instability of Yugoslavia and that the question of Germany was a central issue of <coughs> Europe of Europe explains why Tito tried to influence the stance towards the German question of as many countries as possible. It was in Yugoslavia's best interest to, pres to preserve the status quo in Europe. If the established balance of power could begin to change, Yugoslavia should try to be as active as possible and with the support of non-line countries, make its voice be heard. When the policy of West Germany started to change with Kurt Kissinger's notes of 1966 and finally Willy Brandt's Ostpolitik, Tito decided it was time to make a move 
which has in recent historiography in Yugoslavia become known as Yugoslavia's return to Europe, and which led to an intensive involvement of, of, of Yugoslavia in the CESC ne negotiations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, next speaker is um, Bogdan Zhitkovic. We go on in bothering you with Yugoslavia. <laughs> Uh, dear colleagues, colleagues, my name is Bogdan Zivković and I am a historian from Serbia, currently on my PhD studies in Rome at La Sapienza University. And my field of research are the relations between Yugoslavia and the Communist Party of Italy. And here now and today, I wanted to talk, to you in my pre to talk about in my presentation about the important impact the Hungarian crisis had on these relations. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to do so, to do that in Budapest. So thank you to all the organizers for, for uh, making this possible. And as you can see, first, just a little clarification in, uh, of terms. You, all, all of you know that there are many possible terms about the events in Hungary uh, in 1956. And the reason I uh, chose the term crisis is because the actors I'm talking about mostly use that term. And at the same time, it's a neutral term that suits the complex use they, they had. They sometimes labeled events in Hungary as a just uprising, and sometimes saw them as a counter-revolution. In a way, they were somewhere, somewhere between the Eastern and the Western views about Hungary, because at the same time, they were autonomous from Moscow, but Orthodox communists. And before uh, we dig deeper into the topic of my presentation, I just want to give you a little bit of context. That is the history of the two parties and of their relations. And the most important thing to underline now is that they were often perceived as the dissident parties of the communist movement and how and when they deserved to be labeled dissident. The main event for the Yugoslavs, as you know, is 1948, split with the Soviet Union, non-alignment, etc., etc. But on the other hand, uh, the Italian party, we can call her <laughs> it a late blooming dissident of the Cold War. In 56, for example, it remained loyal to Moscow, but started to develop its autonomy. And in 68, uh, the Italians openly questioned the hegemony of Moscow, condemned the Soviet military intervention in Czechoslovakia. And the climax of that path was Eurocommunism. That was a platform devised by the leader of the party, Enrico Berlinguer. That platform was somewhat vague, but it was perceived as a democratic and flexible vision of communism, and it was likable to many in that period. And also it presented the climax of the relations between the Italian and the Yugoslav party. And the political and financial aid coming from Belgrade in that period was substantial. But if we go back to 1956, that friendship was still somewhat distant. If we go back uh, even before to the period after the Second World War, there were many problems that hampered the relations between the two parties. The Yugoslav-Italian state conflict about the territory of Trieste, but also, and more importantly, the Yugoslav-Soviet conflict of 48. Being loyal to Moscow, the Italian party joined the Soviet propaganda war against Yugoslavia. Belgrade responded also, financed the dissidents in the Italian party. And despite all of that, uh, the Italians were not so fierce like the other communist uh, parties in that conflict. And there were some ideological similarities that brought the two parties together. And soon, when the international problems that divided were solved, there was a space to collaborate again. In 54, Italy and Yugoslavia agreed to temporarily divide the territory of Trieste. And in 55, Khrushchev visited Belgrade. And the visit was an important signal for all other parties in the movement to start communicating with the Yugoslav comrade once again. Italians were most uh, may enthusiastically accepted this challenge, this change maybe more than any other party in the movement. And we arrived to the year of 1956, one of the most crucial years in the history of international communism. There is no need to explain in Budapest more. 
And at the beginning of that year, it seemed that a new phase in the relations had begun. It was an enthusiastically initiated collaboration, mutual support in mutual struggle against the Soviet hegemony. The main events that uh, are symbols of this fight against Soviet hegemony was the Moscow Declaration between Yugoslav uh, Yugoslavian Soviet Party and the Toliatis theory of polycentrism. And the main idea pr uh, promoted in this document and in Toliatis theory is that the parties inside the communist movement should be autonomous and that any center in the movement should cease to exist. Also, the two, the two parties went furthest in de-Stalinization, or at least we can say that they went further, furthest in criticizing the Soviet system, not just Stalin personally, as Khrushchev did. And of course, all of that irritated the Soviets, and the Hungarian crisis was just a good opportunity for Moscow to block these activities and to postpone this subversive collaboration between Yugoslav and Italian communists for the late 60s. To, the, to this Soviet pressure, the two parties reacted differently. Yugoslavia started a new conflict, and Natalia told you about that. Uh, at first, Tito accepted the second Soviet intervention in Hungary, agreed to it in a meeting with Khrushchev in Brioni. Just a couple of days later, he changed, he a little bit changed his views, and he started publicly condemning many aspects of the Soviet activity in Hungary. The historians had responded to the question why has Tito acted in this manner, that he partly done that to preserve his relations with the West, but his main, e main aim, and more important, was his wish to separate from the East, as the Soviet pressure to re-enter the communist bloc became unbearable. The Italian communists, even not, not so unanimously and decisively, as you will see in this presentation, aligned with Moscow in the end and supported its actions in Hungary. Like in 48, in 56, Moscow once again divided the two parties and created a conflict between, the, between them, trying to regain absolute control in the movement. In the next few minutes, and from the perspective of Belgrade, I will give you a detailed depiction of the relations between the Yugoslav and the Italian party during the crisis in Hungary, their views on the situation in Hungary, and the talks they had regarding this topic. And just at the beginning of, of the, the eruption of the crisis in Hungary, a high-ranked delegation of the Italian communists was returning from Belgrade from a successful visit. And the initial reaction of the Italians to the news from Hungary was to instantly alienate from Yugoslavia, just not to irritate Moscow. And therefore, the reports in the party's newspapers about the visit were consider considerably colder than the visit has really been. And Velio Spano, a high-ranking member of the party, admitted that in a conversation with a Yugoslav diplomat on October 27th. And in this conversation, Spano gave other important information. He talked about the chaos in the party, a fear that the military intervention will have a devastating influence on the prestige of communism in Italy. And at this point, the Italian communists primarily blamed the Hungarian party and the Soviets, seeing their belated actions as the main cause for the devastating situation and perceiving the military intervention as a terrible move. And these first reactions show us that the Italian communists had not been informed of Soviet actions and that they clearly opposed Soviet actions. So even they were distance, distancing from Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia had no profound problems with all the things Spano told. But when the Italian communists shifted from the initial chaos to full support to the actions of the USSR, the Yugoslav documents show us a deep disappointment in Belgrade. Just to clarify a bit, the Yugoslavs were a bit self-confident and sometimes even arrogant uh, in their behavior towards other communist party, parties, and they perceived Yugoslavia as the leader of these Stalinizations, the ones that uh, first condemned Stalin. And the Italians were evaluated in Belgrade as the second best, the one who, ones who went further than all of the other parties on that path. And because of that previous positive attitude, the disappointment was even more profound and dominated the report that I'll be talking about that came from the embassy in Rome on November 10th. The perception was a bit simplistic and the situation in the Italian party was viewed as a fight against the bad old forces and the new and good ones. The bad forces, the ones that were winning, were the party officials that supported the Soviet actions in Hungary and tried to revive Stalinism. At the same time, many of them accused Tito of being the main cause for all the problems and as an inspiration 
inspiration to the revolt in Hungary. They also censored Yugoslav information. On the other hand, perceived as the good, new, and anti-Stalinist forces, there was the opposition regarding the Hungarian question. This opposition went from top to, uh, to bottom of the party, and many of those individuals were known Yugoslav friends or close to Yugoslav views on Hungary. And that initial pessimism soon became nuanced. As Toljati showed some criticism of the Soviets, approved some Yugoslav views, etc. And at the end of November, Anton Vratusha, who was a man highly respected in the Italian party, went on a mission to Rome, trying to create a dialogue with the Italian party regarding Hungary. First conversation he had was on November 26, with some leading officials of the Italian party like Luigi Longo, Velio Spano, Giancarlo Paeta, and Renato Mieli. And for the Yugoslav diplomat, this conversation was not so inspiring. And the Italians were growing more and more closer to the Soviets, giving up on all the principles that brought Yugoslavia and the Italian communists together during 1956. They were afraid. They asked why Tito had to publicly attack the Soviet Union. Why is he entering a new conflict? They can be devastating. Regarding Hungary, they only talked about a counter-revolution and about Imre Naj as a bandit. At the end, Vratusha had the impression that he managed to moderate their views just a little bit. He talked about the need to go public and to fir firmly stop the revival of Stalinist forces. Vratusha told that while Yugoslavia was silent about the just struggle of Gomuka, and while Yugoslavia supported Gero on Soviet request, there was no more room for silence. One of the reactions uh, Vratusha emphasized as positive was that all of them were discussed with the kidnapping of Nach. And we come to the second conversation in Vratusha had, which was much more inspiring, interesting, and unexpected from the Yugoslav point of view. Uh, he had that conversation with the party's leader, Toljati, during a reception at the Yugoslav embassy on November 29th. And those unexpected views in the case of Hungary was Toljati's support for the fact that Tito went public in his critiques of the Soviets. The Italian leader told that he looked at Hungary at the same way Tito did in his Pula speech especially condemning the first Soviet intervention, but that he just does not have the possibility to say it publicly. He also criticized the Soviets regarding the kidnap of Naji and revealed his biggest concern, that the Soviet mistakes uh, will make him lose a lot of votes in Italy. And Vratusha made a conclusion in his report sent to Belgrade that Toljati changes his views when he has Yugoslav information and that a more active communication with him sh should be developed. And we have at this point, uh, uh, the perception of Belgrade that Toljati is a bright star in the party, someone who brings positive change, positive ideas, close to Yugoslav principles, and therefore he would be supported and even when he publicly aligns with Moscow. In December, uh, excuse me, next slide. Uh, in December, uh, the Italian party held its eighth congress, and that when we look at the report of the Yugoslav de delegation and focus on the Hungarian crisis, we see that there was a conflict of views between foreign delegations, delegations of communist parties. On the one side, there were the Soviet, Chinese, Czechoslovakian, French, and Bulgarian delegation. They uh, perceived the events in Hungary simply as a counter-revolution. In their dogmatic views, it was just a conspiracy of imperialism, nothing more. And the Hungarian party made no mistakes. On the other side were the Yugoslav and the Polish delegates. And they emphasized the mistakes made by the Hungarian party, the, its bureaucratization, and perceived it as the main culprit. And the Yugoslav perception was that Taliati was somewhere in between of these two harshly suppo uh, opposed views. And during these months, uh, we have also a, 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 an important phenomenon, the opposition in the Italian party regarding the Soviet interventions. It was considerably large in number. And what is interesting that many of them, as I told earlier, were showing big admiration for Yugoslavia. For example, Furio Diaz, who was a high-ranking member of the party, told that Tito has more right in his views on Hungary than Toljati. And there is also the important and famous case of Eugenio Reale, who even uh, seized his membership in the party because of the party's support for the Soviet intervention. And the first thing he did next was that he approached the Yugoslav embassy and tried to get financial and political aid for his uh, future activity. And in spite of the fact that this opposition was pro-Yugoslav and that the Yugoslav officials felt close to them, the decision was not to give them any support and to support Toljati. 
the rationale behind this, as I explained it earlier, was that Kalyati was in fact someone close to Yugoslavia and that his leadership should not be questioned. And at the end, what are the wider implications and conclusions that we can draw from this case study? The Hungarian crisis provoked Moscow to block the renewal of relations between Yugoslavia and the Communist Party of Italy, even created a new conflict in 58. That dangerous subversiveness came under control, and Moscow gained to control the situ uh, managed to control the situation in the uh, entire inter international communist movement in general, because these, these two parties were just a part of a descent of wider scope. The Italians remained loyal for some time, and the conflict with the Yugoslavs prevented Yugoslavia to further influence the reformist forces in the camp. On the other hand, if we look in long term, the Moscow's suppression of destalinization and reformism was bound to be defeated. In the case of Yugoslav and Italian communists, two parties developed a close friendship, fighting against the Soviet hegemony and leaving an important impact on the socialist camp and the international communist movement both. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, the next speaker is Ratsko Lombard. Hello, colleagues. I'd like to uh, thank the organizers as well, not to parrot everything that has been already said. Uh, my name is Rastko Lomper. I'm an MA student from Belgrade. And uh, as I've already said in the discussion, I'm somewhat of a tourist here. My primary uh, research uh, is not in the field of Cold War history, but what I will uh, talk about today was a result of um, pretty much of an accident where I, uh, following up... Um, uh, the, the fates of people who were interest, interesting for me uh, out of other reasons resulted in finding this case study, sort of stumbling upon it. And I decided uh, that it was uh, very important and interesting, and here I am. So, uh, Tito's secret weapon, uh, right-wing political prisoners as anti-Soviet propagandists. The victory in the World War II was not the end of the struggle for the Yugoslav communist leadership. The country was devastated by the ferocious war, the food was dwindling, and the Yugoslav peoples were divided and confronted. The party attempted to solve these problems by nationalizing and collectivizing the economy and quelling all dissent. The communist takeover of 1944-1945 was followed with repression and punishment. Thousands of class enemies and fascist collaborators were executed without a trial, some of whom had actually been guilty, while others were simply deemed untrustworthy. A number of enemies were taken prisoner, either in combat or they were turned over by the Western allies. However, the country, albeit pacified, was not entirely complicit. In the first elections after the war, 22% of the voters refused to vote for the People's Front, the only allowed entry. The political prisoners after the war can be divided into three groups. The high-ranking collaborators and Chetniks, the less important anti-communists, and bourgeois politicians who accepted the new order but were still arrested. The first group consisted of people like collaborationist Prime Minister of Serbia, General Milan Edic, the leader of the Chetnik Resistance, General Dragulub Mihailovic, the leaders of the Yugoslav Anti-Marxist Committee, Senator Milan Popovic, and others. They were the most important enemies of the regime, and they had to be swiftly punished. Mihailovic and Popovic were sentenced to death and executed while Nedic committed suicide. A number of their close associates close, uh, uh, shared their fate in the first years after the war. The second group was filled by people whose actions were not as important, but which could not be forgiven, so they received time sentences, none less than 10 years. The third group consisted of people like Dragoli Bivanovic and Kosta Kumanudi, democratic politicians who accepted and somewhat supported the communist takeover, and who thought that a democratic opposition could be possible within the system. Their hopes were in vain, the system tolerated no opposition, and they were either forced, forced into passivity, like Milan Grohl, or sentenced to prison. Political prisoners were kept in a number of prisons in the newly organized state, Lepoglava, Glavnia, Chasemska, Mitrovica, and later Goliotok. The most important people's enemies were held at Sremska Mitrovica, a city 70 kilometers away from Belgrade, in a prison built in Austro-Hungarian times. There are several memoirs which can help us describe the circumstances under which the political prisoners lived. Those accounts are understandably vitriolic and biased and cannot be taken for granted, but are doubtlessly important. Other primary sources can help us better understand the living conditions and compare them with those in other systems. An obvious candidate for comparison would be the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, whose prison system the communists inherited and upgraded. The socialist Yugoslavia was less free, less democratic, and more repressive than the previous regime, and that is evident in its prison system as well. 
A great example would be the fact that a prison cell made for 13 inmates in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia was occupied by more than 200 in socialist times. The Stalinist methods passed on by um, comrades from Moscow left their mark on the Yugoslav dissidents. Dragor Ivanovic, whose agrarian leftist ideas landed him jail time in both regimes, claimed in his memoirs that the living conditions were far worse during his second incarceration. There was not enough food. Rations consisted of around 200 grams of molded bread and soup made from roots. The prisoners had very little space. They testified that it was impossible to turn at night because you were so close to the next inmate. Diseases ran rampant since even those sick with THC or syphilis were not removed from the cells. The doctors who, was, who were also prisoners were encouraged to be as brutal to their patients as possible in order to be pardoned. There were no blankets and no showers. The cold and stench were unbearable. Newspapers and books, other than Marxist Leninist literature, were forbidden and those found with them were punished. The average criminals were instructed to harass and spy on the political prisoners. The Yugoslav authorities, haunted by the experiences of the civil war, were intent on making their enemies suffer. However, the year 1948 brought the biggest challenge, challenge the Yugoslav leadership had ever faced. Tito and his allies were suddenly alone, without an ally amongst the great powers, and left to their own devices. Their first move was to quell the dissidents in the Communist Party and to punish those who chose to remain loyal to Stalin. Soon the prisons were being filled by another type of political prisoners, the hardliner communists. A situation arose which seemed completely unlikely merely months before. The IBLC, named after the Informational Bureau, were not treated better than the collaborators and other political prisoners. They suffered from the hands of their own comrades the same fate as their wartime enemies. The Goliotok, an island prison in the Adriatic, would become the symbol of communist repression. The key problem for the leadership was the fact that Yugoslavia heavily relied on the USSR in foreign policy, and after the break, it lacked an adequate propaganda apparatus to combat the great power in, in a war of words. The solution to this acute problem was found in the cells of the Svenska Mitrovica prisons. The communists realized that they had in their hands many doctors, academics, lawyers, and officers. Those people were the elite of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia who traveled the world and spoke foreign languages. They were also completely dependent on their jailers and held at the most um, secure prison in the country and were therefore absolutely controllable. They hated the Moscovite Bolsheviks even more than the Yugoslav, since they thought that the head of the quote, evil, head, uh, evil snake of communism, end quote, was in Moscow. They knew that the prison sentences they were given were only ad hoc, and they saw many examples that affirmed that their life depended solely on the services provided to the new authorities. For example, Milivoj Ivanovic, who was a high-ranking officer of the special police during the occupation, served only a few years in jail, after which he was pardoned and even given a position in the new police. Those political prisoners who were deemed most useful uh, were organized in a special task force, known amongst them as the Translation Group, and moved away from others. The members of it left different testimonies of when it was created, which in my opinion means that they were not brought in en masse, but only after the initial attempts were assessed to be a success. Therefore, the beginnings of the translation group can be traced to early 1949. This operation was led by the Office of State Security and a man known to the inmates as Colonel Franja. The communists needed a, prison to organize, a prisoner to organize his colleagues and to direct and instruct them. They needed, uh, needed a middleman. The natural choice was Danilo Gregoric. Gregoric was a Slovene whose family moved to Serbia where he grew up. He was a brilliant law student who observed and admired the rise of fascism and Nazism in Italy and Germany. He defended his PhD thesis on the economy of the National Socialism and was the best expert in Yugoslavia for the doctrine of corporatism. His admiration for fascism was by no means purely academic and he joined Yugoslav National Movement's board, a radical right-wing party. Being pragmatic, he realized the party's shortcomings and sided with Prime Minister Stojinovic. For his allegiance, he was awarded with a high-ranking job at Journal Vreme, which was the main regime newspaper in the country. He outlived the Dinovich government and served as unofficial envoy of Svetkovic's government to Nazi Germany. His missions were instrumental in the process which led to Yugoslavia joining the Axis in 1941. After the coup d'etat on the 27th of March, he was imprisoned by the new government and was set free by the occupying Germans. He briefly stayed in Belgrade and moved to Germany in 1942, where he worked as a reporter. He was turned over to the communists by the Americans and sentenced to 18 years in prison. His propagandist potential, as well as his pragmatism, were noted by the new authorities, and he was placed in charge of the operation. There was no shortage of inmates willing to cooperate. Those who did were given more food and were moved away from cramped cells. They were promised shorter prison sentences and those sentences to death 
would have their lives prolonged. Others had a simpler reason to cooperate. As Magazinovich put it, quote, there was finally something to do, end quote. However, they allegedly had a mutual agreement not to work too quick. In other words, not to help the communists too much. This code was broken only by Gregorich, who worked tirelessly in order to be noticed and pardoned. He was distrusted by the other prisoners for that and shunned from their company. It is unclear exactly how many prisoners were in the group. Some estimate the number on around 300. The group was quite diverse. In it, there were Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, Germans, Hungarians, Russians, and many others. The most notable amongst them were Dragomir Stodinović, brother of Yugoslav Prime Minister Milan Stodinović, Milan Rajić, Yugoslav politician, Hrvoj Magazinović, and others. It was rumored that even high-ranking Nazi officials during the occupation, like Neuhausen and Neubacher, were amongst them. They were divided into several groups, by, both by who they worked for and what was the nature of their duties. There were those whose tasks, tasks were primarily translations, and th they were kept busy with hundreds of foreign books, most of them textbooks. They could, of course, not be credited with the translations, and those books remained unsigned. Secondly, there were those which were responsible for creating memorandums and making sense of thousands of pages left by the Germans and the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. They were working for the Office of State Security, Ministry of Interior Affairs, and the Yugoslav Army. In order to be completely informed, a special radio group was established on the second floor. Prisoners were tuned in to all stations, Soviet, Romanian, Hungarian, British, French, and American. They would detect important news and compose a special bulletin in five examples, which would then be sent to Belgrade. However, the most important task the prisoners were entrusted with was combating the Soviet propaganda against Yugoslavia and countering it with their own accusations. Milan Rajic testified how, uh, testified how ecstatic uh, the prisoners were to be able to attack Moscow. Quote, the prisoners heavily attacked Stalin, Sovietia, and the satellite countries. They had the unique opportunity to enact their anger and hatred toward communism and Moscow, and there was no end to their wrath. The fight was merciless, fact-based, and suc so successful that Moscow press and radio screamed out of anger, end quote. This unique liberty given to the prisoners was not understandable for many of their communist jailers. Even more appalled were the hardliner communists who were now also in prisons to see their mortal enemies not only treated better than them, but also free to attack the USSR. The anti-Soviet propaganda was quite simple. The USSR was painted as hegemonic, whose other countries followed orders, other countries followed blindly. They had no right to their own policies and versions of socialism, and even as it was sometimes claimed to their own language. The Soviet decisions were assessed to be driven by great Russian chauvinism. The peoples of the Soviet Union and even low party members were not demonized, but rather portrayed as honest true flowers deceived by their leaders. The Soviets who were painted as despotic rulers who sought to hinder any alternative model, regardless of how socialist it was. Yugoslavia was presented as an honest fighter for world, world socialism and a victim of the Soviet oppression. The key difference between this anti-Soviet propaganda and that which they disseminated in the 20s and the 30s was the fact that communism itself, the Marxist-Leninist ideas, were not attacked. Yugoslavia was rather presented as a beacon of independent socialist thought. The highlight of this campaign was the speech of Milo Angelas at the Security Council of, in the, of the UN in November 15, 1949. In his speech, Gilas confronted the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Soviet Union, Vyshinsky, and emphasized the hypocrisy of his motion. The political prisoners were busy weeks prior to this speech collecting and preparing data which would be sufficiently armed. He highlighted the lies in the process of the Hungarian communist Laszlo Reich, who was accused of having ties with Yugoslav authorities and Gestapo. Gilas, armed with adequate data, proceed to document the impossibility of these ties by listing examples of fa false claims the court made. Another time the translation group was put to work was during the Great Assembly of the UN in Paris, 1951-1952, when they were entrusted with arming the Yugoslav delegation with statistics and data. A special courier line was organized between Paris, Batinica prison, and the prim uh, uh, pardon me, Batinica airport, and the prison in Sremska Mitrovica. On the other hand, the prisoners were also used to defend Yugoslavia against accusations from the Eastern Bloc. A special series of articles was established in the official journal of the Communist Party Borba, called Against Slander and Misinformation. The articles featured on it were often unsigned, a clear suggestion that a prisoner wrote it. They responded to claims from radios from Moscow, Warsaw, Budapest, Prague, Tirana, and press from all over the communist world. It aimed to demonstrate the lack of freedom in the Eastern Bloc and the parroting of the claims made in Moscow, as well as to assure its own population that these claims were entirely baseless. The translation group was, however, not designed to be permanent. 
It was there simply to provide the authorities with a few years to organize and consolidate its ranks. It was disbanded in 1953, and its members were separated again. Uh, they had different fates. Those sentenced to death were executed, like Stod um, some, like Stodinovic, were let go, and others continued their incarceration. Gregorich was transferred to Belgrade in 1954, where he worked directly for the UDB. He died under suspicious circumstances in 1957. On the other hand, during the mid-50s, the conditions of life in Yugoslav prisons improved. The leadership was destined to present itself to the West as more democratic and free than the Eastern Bloc. Beds and heating were installed, press and visits allowed. The ordinary criminals were separated from the political ones. This episode, however marginal in the grand scheme of the Yugoslav-Soviet split and Cold War history in general, is a brilliant example of the impact of political shifts in the lives of ordinary people. This tale within the walls of a secured prison depicts how fast and uncontrolled the events occurred in those crucial years after World War II. It shows the truth of the old proverb, your enemy's enemy is your friend, especially when you have him locked up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and the next uh, speaker is Mark Zepperson. Okay, first of all, welcome everyone. I hope you are not as tired as me at this uh, uh, last part of the conference for today. Uh, yes, as you can see, my uh, topic is uh, connected to sports history about the Olympic Games of Los Angeles and uh, the connections between the Olympics and the Hungarian society and political parties as well. Uh, okay, first of all, as, uh, as a brainstorming, Something wrong with it. Oh, nothing. Okay. So, as a brainstorming or uh, idea giving, uh, let's see four key parts uh, of political fights in the modern Olympic movement. These four key parts are the following uh, organizing the games. Uh, very interesting question uh, for nowadays, for Hungary as well. But I do not want to go into political details, actual political details as well, but it's uh, it's a very complex question, but uh, it uh, as well. It is, uh, it is. This is a part of uh, the political fight uh, in relation with Los Angeles too. Uh, secondly, the international appreciation. Uh, thirdly, um, a very important part as well: the medals and the national glory, uh, especially for Hungary as well, because we are very proud of our uh, Olympic uh, results and our Olympic team too and uh, the positions inside of international sports organizations. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to overview the background and the specialized literature of Olympism uh, about the connection between sports and politics and Olympic institutes. Uh, it is such a general statement, but true, that politics has been ensnaring sports life since the ancient times, and especially true for the Olympic Games. Uh, in the 20th century, the sports became a tool of foreign policy, and in the Cold War, it was gathering new issues, methods, and frameworks. In addition, uh, during the Cold War, the, the games uh, ensured a great field to demonstrate changes because the two political blocs totally involved this progress. It is important to add uh, that connections between sports and politics have many positive and many negative sides and features at the same time. Secondly, the Olympic movement has a strange history with many turning points. Uh, but at the same time, it, uh, it had been always having hidden secret goals already after its establishment. We can observe cruel national and international games and purposes, uh, which determine decisions and consequences. Uh, so the moral crises of the Olympic movement were also completed by political fights and uh, na uh, nationalistic purposes. Uh, and these uh, crises led absences and boycotts. Uh, and these conflicts symbolize the divided world. Uh, 
uh, and always influence the involved nations' uh, Olympic participation. Uh, thirdly, the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, uh, had an important role to, to flatten international contests as well. Uh, we can say this organization could not protect the Olympic movement from uh, international political effects, and the chief executives or the, or the presidents of the IOC were always uh, very key figures in the progress. Uh, we can have a look at, for example, uh, every brandage uh, and uh, the solutions of the 1972 Munich, uh, or the chief executive or the president, uh, Lord Killanin, who could, not, who could not help and solve the American boycott uh, in 1980 Moscow, and the chief executive, Juan Antonio Samaranch, who saved the Olympic movement, who actually saved the Olympic movement uh, after Los Angeles 1984. And these men and uh, directions solved and ignored problems at the same time. Uh, thirdly, avoiding countries chose boycotts because of political reasons. But boycotts only hurt the athletes and the sport itself. We can observe broken careers and dreams, so uh, sportsmen and Olympians were the biggest victims of these kind of decisions. Uh, society's reactions were always based on the press and uh, the media, which is a certain role as well. And um, a very important uh, thing, uh, boycotts as a political tool is not so effective. And uh, by the way, uh, what is the difference or are there any differences between boycotts and non-participation? The Soviets said, yes, there are differences. Maybe it's an interesting thing to take it into consideration. Uh, and, uh, uh, in fact, uh, as I've uh, already mentioned, the boycott's not so effective. It uh, did not solve all. In fact, it solved only a few problems in the progress. And finally, in connection with Los Angeles, however, socialist boycotts were voted by national Olympic committees. The socialist parties' committees put them uh, under pressure. Okay. Uh, here you can have a look at my most important documents and the uh, research elements. The material of Hungary National Archives is the uh, most important. Just to notice, the OTSH uh, was the most important Hungarian sports leading organization uh, between 1973 and 1986. Uh, it's a strange situation because uh, we had an own Olympic Committee, an own National Olympic Committee, and OTSH2, but both were actually directed, by, of course, by the, by the party, by the Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party. Uh, and the material of state security has a key role too, as well as the, uh, the Olympic Museum, which is uh, in Lausanne, uh, Switzerland. And it is a good field uh, for sport, uh, sport researchers um, uh, as well. And the press material uh, in connection with this topic is very deep and very colorful too. And uh, last but not least, uh, personal interviews and memoirs of uh, sports leaders and athletes are always interesting. But at this point, um, this, is, uh, this is the so-called oral history. Uh, but we have to be very careful and very critical. It's a hard work to collect enough and nevertheless exact information and data uh, from these uh, memoirs and from these interviews. Okay, uh, as I already mentioned, we Hungarians are uh, very successful in the Olympic Games, uh, but we missed twice because of political reasons. And uh, here is a sentence which is, per which is perfectly true for uh, Hungary during the communism before and after the uprising as well. Sports functioned as an institute which was run by the government. Nevertheless, the Communist Party determined complex details of national sports policy. And every issues which were influential international decisions belong to the party and the government. Uh, after that, let me speak about the first boycotted uh, Olympic Games uh, very briefly uh, about Moscow. Uh, yes, we all know the antecedents, the, the Soviet conflict uh, with Afghanistan and, uh, and the answer from the United States, uh, the, the boycotted Olympic uh, Games. And uh, well, uh, in this progress, the Hungarian Olympic Committee uh, had to do uh, professional and political preparation at the same time. Uh, and there were special choosing uh, standpoints for sportsmen. Uh, it is absolutely visible. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, it was a highlighted Olympic in the, in the Eastern Bloc, in the Socialist Bloc, um, because a socialist country organized it. And uh, Hungary had to be successful for 
its motherland and for the Soviet bloc at the same time. Uh, and uh, we had to prove that we are better than the capitalist pigs or uh, than, the, than the Western bloc. <laughs> It's a, it's a serious determination. The Hungarian press used this, uh, of course. Uh, and we had to be happy that we are competing. And the OTS, OTSH and uh, the party and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, evaluated and discussed everything, everything about the Olympics. And uh, they, did, they did it continuously. Uh, they sent and got reports about every step and every happening. Uh, from uh, Moscow and from the Western Bloc uh, as well. And um, what is more important to speak about uh, Los Angeles, which was a very painful for us and for uh, the whole uh, Eastern Bloc, as I think. Um, first of all, uh, uh, okay, uh, obviously the year is 19, uh, 1984. Uh, in April, uh, there was a Hungarian Olympic Committee conference uh, where many political dangers announced uh, in the very first time. And the security of the Eastern teams uh, played a certain role from the very beginnings. Uh, but until this point, until April, uh, it uh, did not have any concrete signs in public opinion. Uh, Hungary prepared for the traveling until the very last moment. And there were no chance to change uh, what the party and, uh, and what the Soviet wanted. Um, however, uh, Pa Schmidt, the president of the Hungarian Olympic Committee, tried to consult uh, with Juan Antonio Samaranc, uh, IOC president. And there was a vote about uh, the participation. And uh, in this vote, uh, many members, uh, of course many members, belong to the party's political committee. Uh, and about the OTSH. Uh, Istvan Buda and uh, Istvan Yacho were the two key figures uh, in this progress. Um, Mr. Buda was a very uh, charismatic sports leader uh, who always tried to protect the interest of the sportsmen, the interest of the athletes. But uh, he had to uh, read the boycott announcements, unfortunately, uh, in the radio. And Istvan Yacho was the only man who, uh, who voted with no in the question of boycott. And, he, uh, and uh, during the vote, he simply stood up and said, it is impossible to do it uh, with the Hungarian athletes. It is, it is totally impossible. And the answer was the following from the party. Uh, he was simply disqualified from the party. And uh, after uh, almost a year, he, had to, he and his whole family had to escape from the country. What a nice answer. And by the way, uh, the boycott vote uh, was a bit different than uh, in other socialist countries, uh, where there was uh, no no vote. Uh, and just like in Poland, uh, where there were many men who voted with no uh, in the National uh, Olympic Committee. In the other countries of the Eastern Bloc, uh, the, the no vote was uh, not really widespread. Uh, it's uh, not really visible. Okay, and the role of the party is obviously the most important. Uh, on April 10th, uh, there was a political committee conference uh, where the party had to react uh, for the events officially. They had to do something, uh, but uh, in the official communication, they just expressed their fears about the security uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles, like the Soviets. Uh, of course, uh, these kind of fears uh, had uh, had no serious uh, fundamentals. Uh, it, the, uh, the only cause, the only cause, the only reason was uh, the revenge, the revenge for Moscow, and uh, it was about the solid solidarity. And uh, they had to prepare and warn the members of the uh, Hungarian Olympic Committee as well about the decision. It was a complex progress. Uh, and later on, uh, of course, they planned uh, the further steps uh, very carefully. Uh, and of course, it included a lot of failures. And we can read about a book which uh, was written about the Olympics, the Olympics, uh, the Games of Los Angeles, uh, where many, uh, there were many unsatisfied people who tried to express their opinions. Uh, but uh, this book uh, was demolished by the party too. And, uh, Finally, uh, some comments about the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, which had uh, a very brief role. Uh, maybe a remarkable event uh, from 1982. Uh, 
uh, when Marat Gramo, uh, the president of the Soviet Olympic Committee, said in Mexico uh, that uh, the Soviet athletes were, will possibly not take part uh, in the games. But it was only uh, a, con a conditional move. It was not a concrete information and not, uh, uh, not, a, not, a, not a known idea. Uh, and, um, and before April 1982, there were no concrete experiences and signs about it. And uh, last but not least, uh, the Hungarian Ministry of Foreign uh, Affairs uh, observed the whole emigration uh, in the United States and uh, almost in the whole world continuously. And there were serious sanctions and penalties. Uh, for example, they didn't allow uh, Sándor Vladar, Hungarian Olympic champion swimmer, to travel uh, to the USA after Los Angeles uh, <coughs> to a simple training camp. It was, uh, it, uh, it was uh, uh, a kind of uh, sad decision as well. And, uh, and let's see final, uh, finally some suggestions about the games of Los Angeles. And, uh, well, uh, you can see many aspects. Uh, maybe the field of the media is the most important in this way. Uh, the press, the radio, and uh, the TV uh, had to make presentations uh, about, not about the Olympics, about the social sport event until the Olympics. And uh, by the way, the party allowed, um, the party allowed uh, moderate broadcasts about Olympic competitions. They allowed uh, only one hour long summarizing programs uh, in the television in the end of the days, but uh, the, the live broadcast uh, was forbidden for the reporters. Uh, well, uh, some uh, features about uh, the Friendship Games, which was uh, actually a socialist Olympic, uh, as we know. Um, uh, well, maybe uh, I would like to highlight the cheatings uh, for example, an American wrestler prepared for the Olympics of Los Angeles with, uh, with Norbert Nevenje, uh, Hungarian Olympic champion wrestler's training program, who won a gold medal in Moscow uh, four years ago. Uh, and, uh, but Nevenje were not allowed, of course, to take part in Los Angeles uh, because of the boycott. So the American athlete won the gold with his training program. Uh, and obviously the referees had uh, mainly the Soviets in the friendship games uh, competitions. And uh, yes, for details for the cheat for the, uh, for about the cheatings, uh, please uh, ask uh, questions if you are interested after the presentation. Yes. Uh, then I collected the most uh, important reports from state security from state security, and most of them, as you can see, are connected to the inner prevention. Uh, and uh, but as you can see, the number of the uh, the emigration news is uh, important as well. And to continue the diagrams, uh, here's another one. Um, uh, so what kind of inner pre uh, inner prevention tasks did the party have? Uh, we can observe a large number of protestings and leaflets in the progress, which were the two most frequent from <laughs> the public. And uh, here you can see some more about this. Uh, my second, uh, the second one is my, uh, my, my personal favorite. We cannot tolerate demagogical propaganda of the party, both legal communist leaders, threat down democracy, and so on and so forth. We have several uh, other uh, examples uh, and distant instances as well. Okay, uh, uh, finally the consequences. Uh, of course, uh, the Hungarian Olympic Committee's decisions in connection with the games uh, uh, totally fit in the Soviet political strategy. And uh, <clears throat> of course, the OTSH played uh, less attention for uh, sports propaganda and, uh, and for the mass sports because of the Olympics challenges. And um, maybe another important one, the Hungarian press only published articles in connection with the games of uh, 1980, 1984, uh, which uh, mirrored the part, uh, the Socialist Party's uh, interest. And uh, uh, I chose two pictures instead of summary. Uh, I think these pictures are uh, perfectly summarizing the, the, uh, the, main, uh, the main frameworks of the, of the Olympics. And uh, finally, I would like to close my presentation with a quote, which is absolutely true for today as well, from Nelson Mandela. Uh, sports has the power to change the world. 
It has the power. Uh, it has the power to inspire. It has uh, the power to unite people in a way that uh, little else does. A sports can awaken hope where there was previously on the despair. And finally, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. And uh, the final presenter is um, uh, Thomas Chanadi. So, hello everyone. My name is Chenadi Tomash. Uh, I'm going to be brief and quick because I assume it was a very long day. So, for everyone. So, I'm going to talk about the. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to talk about natural conceptions and foreign policy, and especially in the case of France. And why I can. Okay. So. Uh, first, let's start what are national conceptions. Basically, these are domestically shared views and understanding, and understanding on how a country should behave in the international system. So the important thing is that they are domestically shared. So it's among the people of the country, it's among the leaders of the country. They are the products of history, memory, and socialization. So it's not like uh, we just come up with something that, okay, from tomorrow, Hungary should be, I don't know, act like a great power. It evolved with the history of the state. Uh, it basically prescribes the role and purpose of the state, and uh, it has its own vocabulary. So that's an important point because that's how we actually find them. We have to search for, for uh, many kind of documents, uh, leader statements, uh, historical uh, documents, everything. And when we do that, uh, we can identify keywords, which uh, I will uh, show you in the case of translator. And based on those keywords, we can uh, realize or we can, uh, we can find these national role conceptions. So they're not only expressing and reflecting, but also affecting the interests and policies. So they're actually also transforming the foreign policy of a nation. And uh, what is most important is, uh, uh, what I already said, it's uh, they are core elements of the national identity. So where can we find them? Uh, these are shared among uh, national political and administrative elites public organizational units, and the relevant foreign policy community, and even uh, amongst the people. So uh, there's, uh, there's a linear uh, importance. So basically, it is shared among the people. But uh, the most important, that it, would, it should be shared uh, in, among the elites. So there should be a strong elite consensus. It's not enough if the people think that let's stay with Hungary, Hungary should uh, should act as a great power and a military power and should, I don't know, uh, intervene in Africa. <coughs> if the elite doesn't think that, then nothing will happen. But on the other side, if the elite has some kind of uh, fixation, like they want to intervene in Africa because they say that Hungary, it will be good for Hungary, but the popular, uh, it's not a popular idea, so the people strongly reject it, then again, it won't work. So it has to be accepted in all levels although the elite and the political leadership is the most important. So uh, these are the priority groups which we have to uh, identify when we're looking for national conceptions, either the public elites, the political advisors, the politicians themselves, professionals, uh, etc. Et so how are they working? Uh, they are uh, historical creations, which means that they appear, develop, and become dominant during a given time period. Although, on the other hand, they can change, they can even recede, but uh, it's uh, very rare that one national conception, conception completely disappears. And even if when they change, it takes several times, it takes uh, a lot of time. They can be contested politically, which means that uh, when there's a role conception, let's stay with the uh, Hungary should be a great power, uh, it's possible that two different parties understand this conception uh, in different ways. One says that, okay, if we are a great power, we should have a great military. The other says, if we are a great power, we should, I don't know, uh, make a great soft power uh, or something. So they can be contested politically. And that's actually the next thing is uh, almost the same, but they are not always clear cut. So they can be contested because they're not 
always uh, clear and logical and standardized. That means that there is a possible tension between them and their elements, which we will see in the case of France. So, how do they actually affect the foreign policy? Well, first of all, they prescribe. Uh, if we understand these national conceptions, we can identify a state's motorway goals, wheels, how it will uh, act to a different scenario. Also, it proscribes. Uh, they make some interest and policy options impossible and uh, helps us to understand what the state will do in any one. And they induce a certain style of foreign policy making. So it helps us in creating our own foreign policy when we want to deal with some other country because we know that, okay, these are the, it's this country's national law conceptions, then they might go, gonna go on this line with this style. So we can counteract. Uh, the interesting thing in these national law conceptions is that every country has that. Actually, it's, uh, it's commonly known. The only problem, or not problem, is that uh, we don't even realize that we're acting along these terms because when we act along these national conceptions, the decision seems normal, right, and uh, basically everything seems fine. So when we are looking for, when we're looking uh, at the TV, uh, at TV, and we're hearing national uh, foreign policy news and everything, and we think that okay, we're going in the right direction, our country is good, then actually our leaders just found the national law conceptions which we were agreeing with and making decisions along them. So that's why we're happy. So. What are the French uh, NRCs? So, as I said, it's evol it evolves with time during history. Well, the, the French national conceptions we can identify today, they are dating back to the late 18th century. But the interesting thing is that it was De Gaulle who fused them into one coherent self view and the one working foreign policy. Uh, before that, it's, uh, it, was, uh, it was used before that as well, but uh, unconsciously. So De Gaulle was the one who wrote the new, uh, who established the new government and actually based the foreign and defense policy of the country uh, willingly on these uh, views and national conceptions. And basically, since then, uh, they're so important that uh, they are still in the use with some modifications. Uh, so where can we find them or uh, what were the sources? The goal identified. The first one is the so-called modern republic. So France was one of the first in Europe was the modern republic when they established their new system. The first who left the feudal system. So basically, they should be the best and uh, oldest republic in Europe, and everybody should take an example from them. Then we had the, the impact of Napoleon. It's uh, it's in the military area. So Napoleon was the first one who almost or actually occupied the continent, the first nation with a grand army. Uh, there's a really important, still there's a really important military connection to the policy, uh, to the foreign policy of the state. Uh, basically, there's the saying that there's no nation without the military. So it's really too, really, really intertwined. Like not in the, not, in the, not like in the case of Germany, where we have the military, which we try to keep low. And we have the big country here. It's like uh, bigger the army is, the glorious, the more glorious the nation is. Uh, then we had the Code Civil de France. Uh, it gave example to many other countries to establish their own uh, juridical system. France was always at the forefront of political, social, and scientific life, the cultural progress, which is very important. So these are the positive ones. These are the sources of the positive national conceptions. The negative one was the first Prussian invasion and the two world wars. The Depression invasion first was uh, interesting because uh, that was when France realized that there might be a problem with the Germans later on. Then came the first world war when there was a problem with the Germans later on. <laughs> uh, basically, the first world war is the more important in light of the Cold War uh, foreign policy of France because uh, they realized that uh, they were relying too much on their allies. So uh, France was, uh, they, lost, uh, they lost many people. Basically the war, oh, you know, the first of all, uh, it was a disaster for France. And uh, the second world war policies, or uh, the, between the two world war policies, was basically an answer to the first world war, where they tried to, tried to uh, grab every, every opportunity to, 
not get into the Second World War, which obviously didn't work well. And then was the Second World War. Uh, sorry, go back a little bit. So the Prussian invasion and the two world wars showed France that if and when Germany uh, is going to get strong again, or if ever gets strong again, France will not be able to stop it alone. But on the other hand, the world wars also showed France that it was relying too much on its allies. And, uh, well, the allies didn't just leave them alone, but they felt uh, a bit of uh, abandonment about the allies. So basically, the idea of Europe and creating Europe came from these two world war scenarios, because after the Second World War, France realized that it won't be able to, to counteract Germany again alone. But it didn't want it to rely on too much on, the, on, on uh, Great Britain or the United States. So they came up with the idea of the European Union. Well, we call it European Union now. It was, they came up with the idea of, the, of Europe led by the French, obviously. So there was a pretty good saying, France within Europe and France through Europe, which basically meant that France in Europe, so when we need Europe, Europe will come to the, to, to the aid of France, but we will need Europe because we are France. And uh, basically that was the explanation that we were done. So, how can we understand France uh, in mind with these national Europe perceptions? So basically uh, after the Second World War, France was best described as a residual world power, which means that uh, it, was a, it was a regional power with global, uh, global aspirations. Uh, it was an active and independent region of ambitions of global campuses. And there were three core NRC concepts, or there are three NRC concepts uh, we can identify. And basically, these three words, or four, were the most important uh, policy-making uh, notions during the Cold War. So independence and grandeur, uh, activism and potential presence. And what do they mean? So uh, this is a, a quote from De Gaulle. Independence means that we decide ourselves what we must do and with whom, without it being imposed upon us by any other state or collectivity. So basically, independence meant what independence means, doing things alone. It was an integral related notion. The interesting thing that uh, was, uh, I talked about a few slides ago, that uh, these conceptions can be contested. Well, independence was actually a very contested concept, because it, the, the explanation went two ways. There was the so-called Anglo-Saxon uh, explanation. Well, it was called Anglo-Saxon explanation because it was negative for the goal and Anglo-Saxon were negative, as you know. So according to that, it was basically nothing else, uh, just denying the reciprocity of international relations. So uh, those who, under, who said that independence was a negative concept and we should abandon it, they argued that uh, as De Gaulle understands it, and De Gaulle wants to use it, it's no good because it's again co collaborate, collaboration, it's again cooperation. It basically means that we have to stand alone in the world, which they said France is not capable of. While on the other hand, the De Gaulle uh, team said uh, that uh, they actually they said that they are just misunderstood because it doesn't exclude cooperation with other nations. It just said that when and where it is possible, we should act alone and uh, we should do things alone. And if there's something big we can't handle, then cooperation can go on. Well, it sounds all good, but uh, in reality, you know what, we, what it meant. It basically meant that they wanted to do anything alone because they said that France is France and France should act alone. And go. Uh, so it meant maintaining national separateness, but not isolation. And actually, that's a key term because the goal understood that as well, that, okay, we want to be independent and we want to do things alone, but being isolated is not so much fun, especially in foreign policy. So uh, there's a strong link between military history and the existence of the nation. That's the Napoleon uh, concept I, I was talking about. Because independence in the under the De Gaulle team also meant that we should need, we need a strong military because uh, without military there's no nation. And the autonomous decision and interest as I was talking about. So basically it was a very uh, very contested, and also grandeur came from independence because when we're independent, we can act independent in the world, so we're a great nation. Uh, this was actually the leading notion of Fifth Republic's foreign policy. So, activism 
another quote from the goal, that's gonna be a lot. In each of these areas, I want friends to play an active part. It is essential that which we say and do be independent of others. So basically, which I haven't told you and I should have told you a slide ago, that, uh, or three slides ago, these three concepts, I'm trying to explain them uh, independently, but they are really, really connected together. So as you see, activism is connected to, uh, to independence, because without independence, you can't be active. Uh, the second quote is from the from a book uh, about the goal, and it's from, it's from an interview uh, with one of his policy advisors. He said that he was convinced the friends' right and duty to act on a word scale. So basically, active is meant that since France is independent and it's acting independently, it should be active as well. So it's not enough to be independent; you should have you should be active. Uh, it interests in participating in indigenous community on one own term. Here's again independence without endangering a dependent relationship with any other country. Here's we can uh, come back, here's we come back uh, to my to our mind. The two world war concepts or uh, national war concepts I, I was told about. Uh, okay, let's start again. Which is a complicated sentence. So endangering the dependent relationship, it actually refers back to the world war uh, feeling when they felt abandoned by the allied and. Uh, that's why they had this being different independent and potential presence. Well, actually, it should be only presence, and it was presence in that era. But we should add potential because we know that France wasn't able to be present in every five continents. Uh, so, so France has chosen to ensure her security by herself to guarantee her independence and maintain her rights. This one is from a white paper or a military uh, strategic paper, paper from the Cold War. And the, this potential presence was actually shown in this. So we can see it. We, they, they have this today as well. These are the confetis of the empire. So basically, this presence didn't mean that the presence should be a real presence. It should be a presence. So we can show that we are present in five continents, even if we have these small islands, which are immensely expensive to do. And there's actually no point, no strategic point, no anything. I mean, there's not even population on some of them. But still, we are presented on five continents, so we are a great power. So, what are the important notions? The important vocabulary I was talking. Uh, Rwanda, Rangloa, are tried prestige and English, so I have to be that because I have five minutes and I have to pass it side left. So basically, these are the terms we could have, we could find, or we found uh, in the documents, history documents we were searching, and from these terms, we can establish the national consensus. So. Let's start the interest. So, what were the interesting policies during the Cold War? Why we can, from these national conceptions, we can identify three different aims: overcoming the superpower, geopolitics, geopoly, so basically independence, removing U.S. and Anglo-Saxon dominance within the West, establish a France and Europe as a third world, world politics. And that's the quote I said: France within Europe and France through Europe. So basically, every move France did during the Cold War, at least according to my presentation, uh, was uh, in the foreign policy era, was aiming to reach one or all three of these goals. So how did it work? On the economy. Well, we all know France was really reliant on uh, the US half after the Second World War. Uh, so they started, they wanted to ensure that France remained a diversified economy, strong technological base, and the prestige of the great nation, because technology gave prestige for the nation. So what did they do? Well, we know the Warsaw Plan was 2.6 billion, uh, which was a really, really big sum. So, going back to this French through Europe and French within Europe, let's tie the French economy to Europe. And then the European Union started, but that's another story. So, what they did, uh, the, the Development Commercial Aircraft, Caravel Airliner, the Concorde Airbus Consortium, uh, they participated in aerospace ventures like Iran rockets, which were a pretty good major contribution to the European Aerospace Program, and the energy supply industry. So these were the three most important at the beginning. These were the ones with which they tried to recreate the great nation, the grandeur of the French Republic. The energy supply is interesting because uh, as of 1973, almost 75% of energy requirements was on imported oil which was pretty bad during the oil crisis in 73 and 79. So from that on, started the development of nuclear power. Here you can see the, one of the aircrafts they uh, created. 
the concourse, we all know that. And here are the nuclear powers. So the interesting thing that from the 70s, the nuclear power was already a very contested idea, and France was the one who actually started to build nuclear powers that time. That also shows us how France was thinking very differently. <coughs> so, well, we don't care what the word says, that nuclear power is bad, we're France, we can do it, so on. we should do it. Other independent thing, which uh, is very unique in France, is the culture, the role of culture. They have a particular attitude to culture. Well, we all know that today, if anybody, uh, anyone knows some French, or ever been to France, French we know they love their culture. Uh, actually, it's good, so they should have it. Uh, I propose the French people that with me, maybe the investors of the culture, are not living, in other words, a French model of civilization. And that's the code word. Uh, it's from President Mitterrand, a French model of civilization. So basically, the culture was used as promoting the French model of civilization in the world, and they wanted to become a great nation through the promotion of culture. So they used it at two levels. First of all, encouraging at home, encouraging fine art, encouraging the mass media, encouraging everybody to participate in the culture, and resisting the US culture, especially the US. So it wasn't said that we're resisting the US culture, but basically that's what they're doing. Uh, the funny thing, or interesting thing, that this resist uh, caused actually pretty serious issues with the United States. And it went from really small things like not, uh, not taking English words to the French, like uh, even when they're talking about different brand names, they tend to, to pronounce them in French way, not in an uh, English way. Like when they say Audi, they say Audi, although Audi is German, so it was a bad example, but uh, you'll see the point. And the Francophone cultural space, which goes back to the French model of civilization, basically it was the idea that uh, as the Commonwealth for the United Kingdom, they're going to make a Francophone work and collect everybody from the old colonial era and promote this French cultural place. Uh, which was actually again uh, went against the United States. So the interesting thing we see throughout the Cold War history is that although it was a Western ally and a strong ally of the United States, but basically they went against everything in, in everything uh, against the United States. So they were very reluctant to lie. So the military, as I told, is very important. Independence, activists, and potential presence. All three has to be presented in the military, so it means that they have to have a large military, they have to have a well equipped military, and that military should be able to strike on every part of the continent. Once they were the strongest in Europe, uh, during the Cold War, the problem was that they had a shortage of modern equipment. So, in order to top that, because uh, the French wouldn't, well, they, wanted, they got some US uh, equipment and they got some help, but uh, it's not the same when you have the army or the equipment from someone, or when you can make it yourself. So, if there's a shortage of modern equipment under the French uh, thinking, then make emphasis on nuclear capabilities, which they did, and the importance and the impact of colonial wars, which was interesting because the two colonial wars, the Vietnam War and the Algerian War, was basically transformed the French military so badly, uh, badly in the sense that it was so not in line with the NATO transformation, that it, uh, it caused pretty good, big problems later. So it has a, distinct, a really distinct organizational structure because of those wars. And they were reluctant to continue to European defense. Sorry, I have to be quick. Zero minutes, okay. I think I ran <laughs> Just one more minute. <laughs> one, of the, one, of the most, I said zero. <laughs> one of the most important thing, or one of the most important thing is the nuclear power. I'm gonna finish here. So basically, there's a pretty good misconception that we think that the French nuclear power came after the Suez humiliation, which is not true. Uh, it's actually started in 1948, 54, sorry, I can't read. And uh, we understand the whole thing. So it's uh, when we try to understand why did the French build a, a nuclear bomb, it was so much needed. But if we look at it from the source of grandeur and we take into consideration all the things I was thinking, I was talking about, these national role conceptions and how France wanted to be big, how France wanted to be a big nation, then the nuclear power makes sense. And uh, one of the most important uh, things with connection to this is that De Gaulle said that the weapon should, uh, must be aimed in all directions. And it's an interesting thing when we think about that France was a, U a US ally. They still said that 
that the French nuclear capabilities should be able to strike everywhere in the world because we are France and we are independent. And uh, during the arms procurement, which I'm going to say just two words, it was very important because France wanted to make their own, uh, own industry, so they built up a really good industry, and from then on, uh, arms export just uh, started to get well. And basically, arms export was important because from the export, because all the companies were state-owned, they were able to, to finance their R&D, research and development, and that's how they managed to build up their, uh, their industry. Here you can see that today, steel is important uh, in global arms market. And here's the sources, and sorry for the evidence. Thank you very much, and um, we have uh, some 10 minutes for discussion, but after that we have um, a reception. Uh, for all the participants of the uh, of our conference for today, and that will be at the, on the second floor, but uh, this will be uh, held jointly with the other conference, with the Cold War workshop, you know, of the Central European University, which will visit it uh, in the morning. Uh, so they will be there, you know, already in a couple of minutes, um, like by uh, 35 or so. So uh, without further ado, I'm asking uh, anyone if you have any questions or comments. Uh, yes, please. Okay, first of all, well, thank you to all the presenters. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is for uh, Natalia Dimic. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you could elaborate uh, a bit on uh, two particular social groups that I think were kind of in between the Yugoslav German affairs, and that would be, on one hand, the, both of which you mentioned briefly, on one hand, the Yugoslav Germans who were expelled or fled in, at the end of the war, and then the Gastarbeiter. Uh, so if you could uh, tell us something on those. Uh, and for uh, Mark, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we were looking at the uh, secret uh, police archives and what the popular perception of uh, this decision of the Hungarian Olympic Committee was. So I was also wondering, were there also any positive decisions? I kind of find it hard to believe that everyone was monolithically kind of behind the U.S. and against the decision to boycott the Olympics. So, yeah, those are my two questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, for both, que for, no, for my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, of course, both social groups you mentioned are very important for Yugoslav-German relations. However, there, I didn't include them in this presentation. First of all, because they're important only or mostly for the bilateral relations between Yugos Yugoslavia and West Germany. And in this presentation, I wanted to talk about the German question as a... Well, yeah. But I would add another social group as very important to uh, for German Yugoslav relations, it is the, the, the political emigres, Yugoslav political emigres who lived and acted in West Germany. So um, I can't talk on this issue, but I don't want to spare too much time. We can continue maybe during the break. Yeah, during the break at the reception. They did the if same, I... just under less pressure than in Yugoslav prisons, <laughs> but many Yugoslav fascist emigres in West Germany worked for Radio Free Europe and other uh, anti-communist uh, propaganda in Munich. The colleagues of Gregory, like okay. Slepcevic and so on. Yeah, that, I agree with you. I mean, they, they worked for the interests both of themselves for their own ideas, they fought for their, their own ideas, but also for this Western anti-communist bloc and for the West German. They had, many of them had, we were talking about political emigres, many of them had close ties with West German government and with West German, other West German officials on lower levels. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, I'm sorry, but what kind of positive decisions did you think of? Just because you were showing all those comments where everybody, uh, 
all the information that the super the police kind of gathered in the street seemed exclusively negative. So I was wondering if there were also positive reactions to the decision of the Hungarian government, because I guess it couldn't have been more than 100% mm -hmm. the kind of monolithic refusal of this government in regard to building the community city. So positive reactions from the public opinion? Yeah, yeah. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can just say it. Yeah, uh, no, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, we, uh, we can see many broken carriers, many broken uh, dreams uh, nowadays as well. So uh, I, uh, I've already asked uh, so many athletes, so many sportsmen about this question and about this topic, and, uh, and they are still nervous and they, they are still terribly angry with this decision. Maybe maybe that's all what I can say. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, any more questions? No? Um, okay, this question is directed to the last presentation. Um, so I think you really hit the um, very particular ideology Charles de Gaulle had um, regarding France and France's position in the um, in the world and during the Cold War, but I guess my question is, is that given that he was only in power from 58 to 68, um, how accurate is it to apply his national um, role conception of France to both like the tripartism period that preceded him and the um, presidents like Pompidou, Estang, uh, Mitterrand that um, succeeded him? Uh, well, actually, I didn't say he was the one who created these national role conceptions. I just said that he was the one who fused them into one by writing the constitution. So he wasn't so influential. Uh, it was a mistake if I was too, making him too influential. He was the one who, while writing the constitution, realized his national role conceptions, maybe even not uh, consciously, just unconsciously. I'm not that deep in, in the thing. I have a very different uh, research topic. Uh, but basically, he was the one who started to fuse them into one and started to use them. And since then, uh, because as I said, when we make decisions based on these conceptions, they feel right. So since then, uh, presidents tend to use this because they feel that these are right, the right decisions. And that's why it feels so influential. But he wasn't the one who created them or who was the right, who was one the writing them down that we should act like this. Mm. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, um, since your topic is France national role conception in the Cold War, I'd like to ask you what is the what are the peculiarities of the France national role conception in the Cold War? If the Cold War affected the France national role conception, and um, I'm particularly interested in. Um, what significance did the process of decolonization have for the probably changing nature of the France's national role conception? Well, the, I actually left half of the presentation out because I was in a hurry. So, <laughs> the decolonization was actually a pretty interesting phase because when the world started the decolonization process, France started the colonization process, uh, not in the same as we think, uh, as they did during the 70s. The idea uh, was that uh, after realizing that they were relying too much on the Allies, and after realizing that they won't be able to contain Germany alone, uh, they came up with the idea of, uh, of a France, uh, it was called the France of 100 million people. So the idea was to somehow channel all the resources, manpower, um, uh, economic resources, and everything, vessel. Uh, of the other colonies, somehow channel them, and that was the Francophone uh, structure, uh, so that in case of a war, these people would come to help, to come for the help, to, uh, come for help, come to help France. So they started the economic colonization of these areas, basically, and uh, that was actually a, started. It started a friction among the. U.S. and the U.K. and France because they already wanted to to uh, to end this colonization. And one of the example for that is the Vietnam War. Uh, we didn't know how it turned out. And uh, I think I asked for it. 
Thank you. Uh, any more questions or comments on uh, um, any of the topics? Which we will have um, still a couple of minutes because the, the other room they have not yet concluded. So, if there is anything to ask or anything to add, look, please. Uh, just on the, the presentation about um, the uh, anti-Stalinist working in this um, prison uh, in Yugoslavia, I wondered um, what kind of source material you, was available to you uh, in putting that together. I was so interested. So thanks for sharing. Thank you for the question. The <clears throat> it's a natural question, what are the sources? Um, First of all, uh, the key sources would be the archives of the UDB, the Office of State Security, which are still um, unopened. Uh, what you can access now with the written authority, and I'm currently in the process of it, is uh, not related to the period after 1945. You can only request uh, your own personal dossier or dossier of part of your family. So this, this uh, Topic which I was spoke on lacked s serious uh, sources from the Office of State Security. However, uh, I drew from the memoirs of the, those who lived there with obvious, uh, as I've said in the presentation as well, a certain degree of bias is to be expected, of course. Uh, and I've um, also uh, drew heavily on the work of um, most uh, <clears throat> important uh, Serbian researcher in the field of uh, communist repression, Sergei Svetković, who wrote volumes on the repression in, in Serbia after, after 1945. So as long uh, uh, with that there are um, funds, sorry I'm boring, uh, there are funds in the archives of Yugoslavia uh, uh, for, um, called the um, a commission for determining the, the crimes of um, the occupator and their helpers, and their dossiers of uh, people who were imprisoned. So those, um, the, and of course, what I uh, forgot to mention was uh, press. Uh, uh, I've um, said it in the <coughs> in my uh, the presentation. If you look, for example, at Borba, the main the main uh, party um, jur journal, and then you scan through the articles and. If it, uh, you could uh, pinpoint in these against slander and inf information, um, you can pinpoint whether or not they were written by prisoners, is whether or not they were uh, signed. Those which were written by party officials were signed. Uh, it was a. Uh, it was uh, important that this was, this was a sign that you were along the party line. But those that were left unsigned are a clear suggestion that they were written by prisoners. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions? Yes, please. So I have two actually. One for the sport presentation. I wonder because you said there wasn't really a time when sport boycotts ever were very helpful politically, but immediately to my mind, the example of South Africa, because you know the South Africans not being able to play cricket or whatever, it, it did. It did really hurt them on, on a social level. It did hurt them, and so I wonder. Maybe it's because it was more sustained, or, or something like like the Olympics. It's just one off, four years. You know, maybe it didn't work because of that. And then also a question about the last presentation. Okay, the elites being more important. That that sounded true, but I wondered a bit about when when the normal guys aren't on board. You said that it's a problem, but in the last kind of 20, 25 years, it hasn't really looked like that, I don't think. I mean, the Iraq war, the biggest protests in most, you know, British, American cities in their whole history w was about this topic. And, okay, they weren't very successful when they went, but they went. So, yeah, th these were my two questions, really. So, I can answer it with one word, actually. Public opinion should be important. <laughs> that's, that's what I, I left out. But, 
be serious. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's important, but not on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So, there we're electing uh, leaders for four years. So, during the four years, there's going to be like I don't know, 50, 100 times when they go against the national consensus. When we're talking about these national local exceptions, there should be fine. Maybe the polls going down, down, then they do something nice. The polls going up, okay. But when they constantly going against, I mean, maybe it's not even four years. Maybe after eight years or. I don't know, 12 years, but at some point, if they're constantly going against, and especially when they're going against core national rural conceptions, because we have conceptions which are uh, more important, we have those which are less important, then that should be a problem when they want to re be re-elected. So it only works in democracies. So when we're talking about dictatorships, then they're lost, and the, the allies wins. So basically, that's how I, I wanted to say it. Uh, okay, the example that you mentioned, uh, the example of South Africa, uh, of course it's included uh, so many issues and so many questions, uh, first of all, uh, in political and social level as well, uh, and uh, I, I, I can just say uh, another example about the Olympics, uh, in the question of, uh, and in the field of boycott uh, and non-participation, there are differences. Uh, of course, boycott is a political decision. Uh, you uh, are avoiding, from somewhere, politically. Uh, Non-participation is another topic, uh, and, it's, uh, and uh, these determinations uh, can be perfectly used uh, for propaganda as well. Let's just see a very brief, very, very brief example. Uh, just before the Olympics uh, of uh, 1984, Los Angeles, the Hungarian press uh, broadcasted the following uh, opinion of uh, the Soviet propaganda. Uh, the USSR, the Soviet Union, uh, not uh, boycotting the Olympic Games, uh, they, uh, this is uh, simply non-participation. The reason is the following, we are still transporting sports equipment to the United States. It's a non-participation. So uh, it, it, can be, it, can, it can be used for any other purposes. In social level, uh, just a very brief comment, uh, of course uh, sports and uh, social issues, social political issues uh, are also appeared uh, <coughs> In the, in the Olympics of, uh, of Berlin, you probably know the example of Jesse Owens, or the, probably of uh, uh, the, in, in the 1960s, the, uh, uh, the political rights for, for Afro-American people. It has uh, also uh, the, an example in the, in the sports. Um, well, maybe it was a question, it was an answer for your question. Maybe, uh, yeah. maybe, 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 maybe after that, okay? <laughs> Okay, yes, thank you very much. And uh, with this, let me uh, close this panel and uh, let me uh, thank the panelists yeah. and also the audience as well for the questions and the comments. And uh, then all of us now, let's move um, up uh, to the second floor where we had the lunch, the, this reception together with the other conference members will be held. And one uh, final announcement, tomorrow we will be in the other room where we were guests uh, in the morning, uh, 103. Uh, and the session will start at 9.30, not 10 o'clock, but 9.30 tomorrow in the morning. So please be there by 9.30. So thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you.